Yeah. All the major networks have covered the story of the Hawaii sailors rescued 900 miles from Japan by the U.S. Navy. In this video, we will separate the fact from the fiction. Watch all the way to the end to get new revelations into this crazy tale of adventure at sea. Appel and Tasha Fuieva set sail from Honolulu for Tahiti at the beginning of May. After months adrift and many unanswered distress calls, they were rescued by the crew of the USS Ashland. When we got the call from the Coast Guard with the uh, specific uh, latitude and longitude, uh, it took us several hours to get there and when upon the station that's when we noticed the sailboat and the two ladies and the two dogs and uh, we put our own small boat in the water. Jennifer Appel expresses her thankfulness for the crew of the Ashland and all they have done for them. In, in a million years, I would have never thought that I would ever be on a Navy ship, a warship, much yeah. less rescued by a warship. Ms. Appel and Ms. Fuyama told two big whoppers that have caused a lot of people to question the veracity of their entire tale of being adrift at sea for five months. The first one was about a Force 11 storm and the second was about some crazy big sharks. We started in Honolulu, Hawaii on May 3rd, 2017, yep. and we planned a roughly 18 day moderate cruise speed trip to Tahiti, Moareia, and Papeete. The first night. <laughs> the first night. We got into a Force 11 storm and it lasted for two nights and three days. And when we were through with that, we were empowered to know that we, we could withstand the forces of nature. The yeah. boat could withstand the forces of nature. And we decided not to return back to Hawaii but to continue on in our journey because we believed that everything sh quote unquote shook out and we'd be all right. Big Island of the Alanui Haha, we ended up in a 411 storm. I checked wind speeds in Hawaii and also the NOAA hurricane site and there were no storm force winds in Hawaii on the four days after they left between May 3rd and May 7th. And we got pushed into what's called the Devil's Triangle. It is an area 160 west and about uh, zero degrees at the equator where boats go in, but they very rarely come out. And if they do, there are no people on them. And we learned that that was a, uh, a tiger shark location and the tiger sharks figured that we had entered their living room and we were not leaving fast enough and they decided to let us know it was time to proceed forward but us being the land lovers that we have been and the greenhorns in the sailing world did not understand their language not at all we stuck it out to the 40 to 50 foot sharks that were that broke somebody else's boat because we saw part of their boat float by us three days later the first group of tiger sharks were probably 20 to 30 feet in length. There were five of them and they had two babies. And they decided to use our vessel to teach their children how to hunt. Um, they attacked at night. We tried to make as copious notes as we could in order to detail the experiences and then the events like the shark attack. We wrote the stories of um, when the dolphins would come. The dogs would let us know because they smell the dolphins coming and videotaping them barking. Unfortunately for Ms. Appel, that book has already been written. It's called Jaws, and it's pure fantasy. Jaws. See it before you go swimming. Most sailboat cruisers are also avid divers, and most divers like diving with sharks. Shark attacks are extremely rare. Tiger sharks don't grow over 17 feet long. They do not attack boats, except in movies. They do not teach their young to hunt, and they do not hunt in packs. Tahiti by subscribing to 
the Slow Boat Sailing YouTube channel. As part of a survivor debrief, the U.S. Coast Guard found out Ms. Apple did not deploy her EPIRB even though she had one on board. Before the AP reported on this, I and others discovered that the sea nymph had a, an EPIRB registered to it under a previous owner. Distress call that you guys made for so long with getting no response. Was it, you know, hard to make that call every day? I mean, what was going through your mind? Oh, yes, that was incredibly depressing. Um, every day we called for uh, 99 days, 98 days, we were rescued on the 99th. It, it just, it, I mean, it was very depressing and it was very hopeless, but it's the only thing you can do. So you do what you can with what you have. You have no other choice. Shot 10 different flares. We got pushed into what's called the Devil's Triangle. It is an area 160 west and about uh, zero degrees at the equator where boats go in, but they very rarely come out. And if they do, there are no people on them. Here is an excerpt of Ms. Apple's emailed response to CNN when they asked her about why she did not deploy the EPIRB when she was making distress calls for 98 straight days over the VHF and setting off flares. Ms. Apple writes, the U.S. Coast Guard Honolulu sector receives many calls a day. They have limited resources for the enormous span of water their area covers. A fair amount of those calls are for people in the process of losing their boat and swimming in the ocean. While I do not deny that a broken spreader, blown backstay, and non-functioning motor are disabling situations, and we all had the same time when we were at the equator and 160 degrees west, our boat was still afloat, we had food and water, and limited maneuvering capacity due to fortifying the broken items on the mast. She goes on, EPIRB calls are for people who are in immediate life-threatening scenario. It would be shameful to call on USCG resources when not in imminent peril and allow someone else to perish because of it. Every sailor knows that land people do not, so please do not allow the spin of ignorance to cloud judgment. The pan-pan distress calls that we made daily after we realized we could not return the last 726 nautical miles to Oahu from roughly 8 degrees north and 156 degrees west that went unanswered and allowed us to reach Wake Island were determined to be due to antenna issues that only allowed for one to two nautical mile reception. We thought we had 200 miles reception and were notified of the discrepancy aboard the Navy vessel. Had we known our calls were going nowhere, we would have used the EPIR, but hindsight is 2020. The whole EPIR story doesn't make any sense. If she was setting off flares and waving a white flag, and doing distress calls because she couldn't control her vessel. She should have popped the EPIRB. She shouldn't have been uh, signaling for 98 days to passing ships. I was like, oh God, we've been saved. It was the most amazing feeling because we honestly did not believe that we would survive another 24 hours in the current situation. We had no idea what to expect, but when we saw that big gray ship coming, it was just relief, <laughs> it was. The fishing vessel was very kind, but they were not adept at towing the boat, and additional structural damage occurred during the 24 hours that we were with them, so they graciously allowed me to swim over to their boat uh, to make a, a mayday call, because we probably had less than 24 hours before our boat sank if we continued on with them. For Jennifer Apple's assertion is that they were not truly in distress, in need of rescue, until after their boat was further damaged by the Taiwanese fishing vessel. While they initially said to reporters that the crew of the Taiwanese fishing vessel treated them kindly, they told the AP when questions were raised about the EPIRB that they felt unsafe aboard the Taiwanese fishing vessel. 
Thus, that is the reason why the Navy had to be called in at great taxpayer expense. I was joking with someone about 10 years ago, and they said, <laughs> what happens when you go out to sea and you get broken? And I said, oh, the Navy will come save me. No lie. It really happened. I filed a Freedom of Information Act with the U.S. Navy to find out the costs of the rescue of Jennifer Apple and Natasha Fuiva. The fourth craziest thing that is a true face palm thing when you think about it in terms of seamanship is why Jennifer Apple did not go into Kiribati's Christmas Island. Uh, the bolt holding the spreader to the, the root collar at the mast bent. Yeah. And we realized that it was starting to shake. And about 700 miles away from Hawaii, it finally went clink. And I said, OK, we're, we're, we can probably nurse it you know, down to the next major island in Kiribati. Yep. And we'll be able to stop there and, and seek safe haven and get up on the mast and fix it. But when we got to Kiribati, the boat was too big to get into their lagoon. So we decided to continue to travel south. The anchorage in Christmas Island, Kiribati, is excellent. It's got 9 to 20 foot depths, and the entrance is about 0.2 miles wide. So definitely a 11 foot beam sailboat can get in there and anchor with no problems whatsoever. We were a little, we were more than 600 miles off course at this point. So we decided to go to the Cooks. And upon entering that area, we found ourselves in a 10 knot current going west with only the ability to sail at four knots going east. So we were traveling backwards and we knew that most of those islands in the upper chain are small atolls, reefs. But we decided to turn around and go back north. There is no such thing as a 10 knot open ocean current. There are only two ways you can explain the 10 knot current, and they both involve serious judgment errors and sailing errors on the, the part of the skipper. Number one, they were sailing backwards. So, Ms. Appel did not know that they were on a, thought they were on attack, thought that she was sailing into the wind getting lift off the sails but in fact they were sailing downwind but she thought they were sailing upwind the second possibility is the 10 knot current uh, was a pass current that they somehow had tr timed the pass wrong instead of at slack tide they went in at flood tide had they waited three more hours they could have gone at slack tide and had no current. I looked at two islands in the Northern Cooks. One of them was an atoll with a pass, which you would have to time, but it was doable. You just need to wait six hours at the maximum. And the other is one that doesn't have a pass, but people anchor on the leeward side. Either place they could have stopped at and remember at this time they had an engine. Ms. Appel and Ms. Fuyava did have access to a GPS. I did not know that in my previous video so I was not sure if they were lost but they were not lost. They knew where in the world they were at any given moment. Ms. Apple said, according to the AP, they had six ways to communicate with multiple backups and none functioned properly. On a, in her interview, she said that exceeds Murphy's Law. In addition to the GPS and emergency beacon, they had an Iridium satellite phone, according to CNN. They had a ham radio or SSB unit and a, a VHF. The VHF antenna 
supposedly was not working properly, as was the antenna for the SSB. But the sat phone does not rely on an antenna, but reportedly, Ms. Apple said it would not connect. I spoke to the Honolulu District 14 of the U.S. Coast Guard, and they said that Ms. Apple is not under investigation, that they only had a survivor debrief, and they have no intention of doing any further investigation into this matter. Given we know Ms. Apple and Ms. Fuiva fabricated the stories about the sharks and about the Force 11 storm, there's a lot of questions that could be asked whether or not they fabricated the story of them being adrift at sea for five months, even though they had a sailboat with a mast upright. And for much of that time, they had a working engine. Ms. Apple is the most famous U.S. sailor in the world today and she has made the U.S. Coast Guard, she's made the U.S. Navy, she's made sailors around the world look like fools. It is the obligation of the U.S. Coast Guard to make sure that this is not a Mayday hoax, which is a felony under U.S. law. If they fail to do so, they will find that these lost at sea hoaxes, which many have alleged have taken place in this case, will become more common as people see how successful Ms. Apple with a case that so many people question has been in garnering public attention. To keep the kooks from coming out of the woodwork, the U.S. Coast Guard should get the GPS signal records from her handheld GPS, Ms. Apple's, and get the Iridium sat phone records so they, they can verify that she has indeed not made any sat phone calls and that she indeed has not visited any land for the last five months prior to her rescue by the U.S. Navy. Moreover, the U.S. Coast Guard needs to make publicly available the survivor debrief interview and not leak little bits of information to the press, but rather write press releases so that the press can have equal access to information. Inexperienced members of the press may misinterpret the statements of the U.S. Coast Guard as the AP misinterpreted the the fact that the U.S. Coast Guard 14th District Honolulu had no intention of conducting an investigation. They only did a survivor debrief. Had they had a press release and made that debrief public instead of leaking it to the Associated Press, that would have been clear to all members of the media. Further, the U.S. Coast Guard needs to look into the information that the Navy gathered why was the boat declared unseaworthy? We don't know that. The Navy has never released that information. That needs to be made public, and that needs to be shared between the Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard. This video was supported in part by viewers like you on patreon.com slash slowboatsailing, Mantis anchors, and fluid plus form 4K cameras.